The opinions expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of Eastlink TV, its sponsors, or partners. Hi there, I'm Gloria McCluskey. You're watching Destination Dartmouth. My destination today is busy Main Street in Dartmouth, and my guest is Graciela Gerbach, Executive Director of Village on Main Business Association. And thank you, Graziella, for being here with me this morning. I know how busy you are, and I really appreciate you taking the time. And you are the executive director of the Village on Main Community Improvement District. Yes, I am. And how long have you been in that position? I've been here for five years. Five since years. 2012. And you're still enjoying it? I am. Good. Um, I'm, I'm reading something that I got from. Um, the internet and I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, you make the statement we're transforming the village on Maine from gray to green, from apart to accessible, and from temperable to sustainable. So how are you doing with all of that? Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're doing with gray to green. Mm -hmm. Well we have worked last year we worked with a group of sustainability students with the School of Sustainability we had two projects that we presented to the class and both of those projects were picked up. So we had 10 students in all and they worked on a couple of projects. So where were they from? They were from all over Canada. We have partnerships with a number of universities here and this one is the School of Sustainability as part of Dalhousie. Oh, yes. In fact, how we always wanted to be a complete and sustainable community and last spring, a young man came to me um, and said, I want to work with you guys and do an internship. And I said, great, except I can't hire you, but I'll give you any job title you want, any job you like, you're the expert. And he said, wow, that's tempting, but I do have to pay my bills. So he said, let me think about that. And he came back with funding um, from the School of Sustainability. Good. He was a graduate. He wasn't even, they, they weren't funding a student. I couldn't hire him on a grant because he was a graduate. And so I matched that funding and we had him here for three months and one of the conditions of the funding was that he work with the school to find some projects, some sustainability projects out of this community. And we always knew that's where we want to go and really sustainability is the foundation of everything. Sustainability is uh, livelihood, uh, human people, sustainable people, sustainable roads, sustainable streets, sustainable, sustainable trails, business. Sustainable business. It's all, everything we do really, generally in life, we should be looking at sustainability, right? So we always kind of thought that and we didn't really call it sustainability. We call it a number of different things and then it hit us. We're talking about sustainability all this time. So when this fella came along, um, I was quite impressed with him. Actually, he came here with another expert, and I, I'm not even going to go into that story because I don't remember the guy's name. And I was impressed that he knew this expert from New York. And I thought, wow, how does this guy know this New York guy? So New York guy went back to New York, and then the student, the graduate now, came to me and said, I was really impressed with that meeting with you. So these uh, students worked on a few projects to, to help us move forward. So we're always doing something. There's no shortage of work to do, that's for sure. So the gray to green, what mm -hmm. have you done there? Mm -hmm. Well, we believe, like probably everybody believes, that parks are really good places and healthy places. Actually, there's studies that adrenaline gets you know, released when you're in a park or walking through a trail and you just feel better. Well, in the village on Maine, which is a photo kilometer radius, there are no parks except for a small little pocket park up the street across from the, co the college. So we definitely need to do something here. On the about corner that. of Woodlawn Road. The corner of Woodlawn and Main Street. Main Street, yes. So the city provided that for us and put a nice little sign in there. So it's ver very well lit. There's park benches and a garbage can. But it's very small. It might be the size of, you know, kind of a good never, size office. It never seems to be used. No. I don't see anybody sitting there either. No. It's no. a little bit of an odd spot. I thought the students might be there um, from the high school and the college. Um, but that's, we know that that's not enough. 
And we're going to be, we are working with the city uh, to look at some of the properties here. We'd like the city to purchase some properties so that we can turn them into green space. Well, HRM already purchased the building with a bridal shop. Was. Yes, they've already started, and we've been working with them to move forward on that. There's a couple of other projects and properties that we're looking at that um, I don't know if I should say really right, right now what they are, but they would really bring some connection because there's Main Street, Lakecrest, and Tacoma are part of this district, and there's really no connection, very, very little connection between Lakecrest and Maine and between Tacoma and Maine. It's hard to cross the street legally um, without walking a half a kilometer to a kilometer. You have to walk down to the lights, cross the lights, and walk back up. So we'd like to see more openings and more public openings between those, and we'd like to see more parks and green spaces. So we also like to bring on, in the spring and summer, we not only have uh, students and graduates from the field of sustainability, but also from architecture and planning, landscape architecture. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're working on and talking to the city about properties, identifying what properties might be good for them to purchase, and then working with our students to take the dimensions of those properties and kind of look at some designs of what we could do, some possibilities. So, from a park to accessible, that mm -hmm. leads into what you're saying. Yeah. And you're trying to make uh, it more accessible for everybody. And what about the um, bus service out mm -hmm. here? I know you were very involved with that because yes. there wasn't a bus running yeah. down Main Street. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, accessibility includes uh, public transit and active transit. Right. So that's what we need to work mm -hmm. on, and we are working on that. These things don't happen overnight. They're not something that you can, you know, put a project together in two or three months or even in a year, expect it to all happen. So it takes a lot of background work and studies in, in the background before it actually happens. So we are like a, we're, in a way, we're like an island. You know how in an island you only can get there one way by boat? Well, yeah. for us, kind of the only way we can get, you can get here from the Dartmouth side or from Hel the Halifax side is by car. It's very difficult to get here by walking or by bike or any other form of active transportation or even transit. The other t way that it's difficult to get here is on the other side of Maine where our district ends. Our district begins at the park low and it ends at the college. So that's our kilometer long piece of Maine. And that's part of why we changed our branding from Main Street Dartmouth Business District to Village on Main. Because Main Street is so long, it goes all the way down the eastern shore. It does. And no one really knew what part, they just thought the whole Main Street was me. And some of the businesses out there kind of were wondering, why am I not in touch with them? Right. So we really wanted to identify what this area is. And it is more of a village center. It's the busy spot near Tacoma. So that's where the Village on Main ends, at the college. So if you look at the active transportation from the college to the eastern shore and all those communities, Auburn, the Prestons, Cherrybrook, Humber Park, for them to get here it's very difficult to walk. Even cycling, and I've cycled myself, cycling down Main Street is very challenging. You'd have to really know what you're doing and have really good balance because it feels like your elbow is in traffic. Your elbow is almost on the line yes. when you're cycling. So there's our island. And you're very again. brave. I know. I just I sold my car a couple of weeks ago and got a bike. Okay. I literally have biked down Maine. We'll leave so it at that for that's now. That's why. That's why I'm saying we're an island because it's hard to get here other than by car. Okay, Graziella. So, we'll leave it at that. Uh, you're watching uh, Destination Dartmouth, and we will be back shortly. We're back. Graziella, I want to talk a little bit more about the transit because I've heard that it is so difficult for people who live here to get to work to Dartmouth mm -hmm. Crossing and mm -hmm. uh, and wherever they're going. Yeah. I think Have it's, you made any yeah, I think it's a problem. Uh, not really. I think it's a problem with all of Dartmouth. What we've at least done is that most of us that work here don't use transit. So over the years, we've been exploring and looking at it further and further and listening to people's stories and finding out this is a Dartmouth to Dartmouth connection problem. Uh, so people will move, for example, to Cole Harbor because they have a job from Halifax or from away in other problems because they have a job in Burnside. But then they don't realize, well, you can't get there. Yeah. 
or y there's a lot of young people. We looked at the demographics of the Coal Harbour and the Westfall areas, and there's actually a lot of people in their 20s and teens in that area, young adults. And those are the kind of people that are still working on their professional life, and they're right. working part-time jobs in stores and malls. Well, guess what? Mac Mall is not too far away, but do you think you can get a bus? from the Auburn, that part of Westfall, to uh, McMack Mall. Very, very difficult. And that's ridiculous. Yeah, and coming back, same thing. Uh, the mall closes and then, the, I've heard that the buses shut down before the mall, uh, before people who are working at the mall can lock up. Um, so it's a serious problem all around. Burnside is a problem. Dartmouth connections are a huge so problem. So nothing has happened? No. I know. It I'm is not. Very little. Yeah, very little has happened. There are a few, few, very few uh, transit changes so far. There's a whole new plan that we all know of year by year. They're going to be rolling out the plan. The, one of the main problems that we have is that the village on Maine is smack in the center of Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And this should be the, the hub, the transit hub. You should almost cross through the village on Main, the Main th Street, to get anywhere in Dartmouth, really. Um, but that's not the case. Instead, the main hub terminal is Portland, Portland Hills. And I've used it lately, and I know that, I, and I've heard even people even say to me when they stop there, when the bus stops there, and they look around and they say, is this safe? It's sort of in the middle of nowhere. Like there's what's what's there? There's nothing next door to it. And when you're there at nine or ten o'clock at night on your own, you do kind of worry. What's right. or is this safe? It well, let's hope safe. they move on that and that you get some better transportation. Yeah. Now uh, I have another uh, article here: Dartmouth's Main Street redesign planned by local business group. Mm -hmm. So elaborate on that, mm -hmm. would you please, Graziella? Yeah. That would be us. We, uh, we were called a business improvement district. That's why they referred to us as a business group. And last year, I brought to the- And you're one of eight. And we are one of eight business improvement districts in all of HRM. And last year, we thought a lot about this. And because we are a little bit more suburban than the, most of the others, and we do a lot of work on infrastructure and kind of transforming, we're not an established, busy, uh, dense area we're actually looking to bring in residential and business. There's very little residential here, and residential and business go together. How do you run a business without residents? So if I said to you, we're a business district, you should live here, you should move here, you'd kind of go, I guess. But if I said, we're a community improvement district, you should live here, consider living here, you, you might be a little more open to it. So we changed our, not, our name, not in a legal way, just more in branding way from a business improvement district to a community improvement district because we believe that it, that will help our businesses. Um, so yeah, so if there's a lot of residents living here with businesses all together, it's, it's community development. So the local business group uh, mm -hmm. that got together, that's your group, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of input from businesses around here? Yes. Before this organization was set up in 2008, um, the city actually was very helpful. They came out to this you area. Mean HRM. HRM. There is no city. Yeah. Okay. No, another story. <laughs> HRM uh, supported some of the suburban areas with some plans and some consultation. And I'm not sure who approached who. I think some of the local businesses might have said to the city or to the planners, you know, we'd like to do something here. We'd like to create a new vision here. And together, I wasn't involved with this organization right. then, but I understand that back then there was a lot of community consultation. And then this organization got started as a result. Because it, and the long and short of it was, wow, these are great plans, but how do we make it happen? And to make it happen, one of the first things, the first thing you need to do is change the land use bylaws. And a community group or a business or a business group can't change those bylaws. And, it has to and be. the planning for Dartmouth is old. It's old, 1978, land, yes. Dartmouth land use bylaws. Yes. So we, we were, uh, at the time, Andrew Younger was the counselor here, and the few businesses that were talking about making this happen didn't really know where or how it was going to happen. They just wanted to make it happen, and Andrew suggested you should become a BID, a business improvement district. And I, I think back then they kind of said, I don't know what that is, but that sounds good, let's do it. And that's how we became a BID, and that's how we moved forward to change the zoning bylaws. So that changed between the mid-2000s, and it took until late 2013 before it was signed and dotted, approved, and got a provincial approval. 
So how many apartment buildings have been built here since then? Since the 2013 change, we've had two new buildings so far. And there's, there's about five or six that I know of that I've been talking to people about and people have shared with me at, at least. And I don't, we're at that point where I don't feel comfortable sharing that, but I know a couple of them. One that's for sale down the road, um, it's a social enterprise. So that's kind of public that it's for sale. So the plan and the design is all ready for that. In fact, when we went to council to change our zoning, our land use bylaws, there was a few other people that were coming with us to council each time that you, you have to go many times, right? We always wondered who these people were. Well, this was a whole group that was working on that project and they've been waiting for the zoning changes to implement the project. So the architectural design, everything is set to go the way is, it should is be. Is that an apartment building? It's a mixed use building with commercial on the bottom yes. and residential above. Good. The social enterprise owns the property and ideally they would like to see a few uh, of the spaces of the apartments for their clientele, not all. And we like that. We like that there's a lot of social agencies here. There's a development plan in the works for the Garden View directly across the street from there. Is there not? Yes, there is. And uh, the Greg Fong is the owner of the Garden View and he's also our president and he's our visionary. And he is look looking to build a sustainable, very sustainable building and doing things that we haven't even heard of before. As well, he's also looking at age friendly. And he's using everything that he's learning and doing for the community, not just for his project. So our whole community, we're looking to use him and his project as an incubator to be a sustainable community and an age friendly community. A place where older people and younger people and young families and children all belong and fit and find have a place How for many them. units? I'm not sure, I think maybe 30-ish. Oh, it's quite a few. Yeah. 30 units. So there'll be sections that older people will be comfortable with, sections that younger people will be comfortable okay. with. Okay, we're taking another break okay. uh, Graziella and we'll be back shortly. Mm -hmm. You're watching Destination Dark. Thanks for staying with us. We're back. Graziella, um, we talked about the development. I want to talk about the membership here. Mm -hmm. How many members do you have? There's about 160 organizations. Most of them are businesses. We, we kind of looked around a few years ago and said there seems to be a lot of wellness kind of businesses here. I wonder how many there are. So we just went through our directory and our list and we realized there's well over 40. We're hovering around 45, 47. That's interesting when you have that many wellness businesses mm -hmm. with no transportation. It is, isn't it? That Very was one of my arguments. It must be all cyclists. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a lot of, like, that includes social enterprise. It's not just medical. Of course, you know, Woodlawn yeah. Medical Clinic, that's one sure. facility with 20 odd or 30 oh, yeah. doctors. Well, that's, that's one yeah. facility. That, I don't count that as 30. I count no. that as one. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Cairo, Physio, Affirmative Venture, Social Enterprise, Veterans, um, Emer Veterans Emergency Transition Services, Black and Educators. And there's lots of parking up for the Woodlawn Medical yeah. Clinic. Oh, there's parking everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> no shortage of parking lot. And, no. and in fact, our theme song is Turn Parking Lots Into Paradise. You know the Jody Mitchell. I know that yeah. song, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, you don't want the parking lots gone, though. In the new plan, there's no front parking. So anything new, we won't see front parking. It'll be in the back. In the back and underneath underground. There'll also be less, pro I think downtown Halifax is the only one that has the minimal that we have requirement for parking, 1.5 per unit, mm -hmm. residential unit. At the same time uh, that we're developing these buildings with very little parking, we're, we're working with the city to slow traffic, be able to get across the street safely, get some trails in, get a connecting trail or pathway or multi-use trail between us as an island, as I said before, to to downtown, to Lake Banook, all of these communities in the east. In but, but with the 1.5 parking yeah. in Halifax, they probably have a bus service. Yes, well that's part so of it. So if you don't have a bus service, yes. uh, you might need more parking. Well, but hopefully that will happen. That's the idea. So you have that many businesses, Yes. and that's where you get your financial ability to run this place. Yes. We are com we're considered to be one of the bids, and there's eight of them, and they all have the same structure yes. of funding. The, the businesses 
pay a tax, and it's not actually coming from the business in the sense it does, but it's from the property owners. It's based on the assessment right. of the property. And if a business is leasing in that property, they'll never see that tax line. No. It's just, I'm sure it's included in their lease. So part of this is educating people to let them know that they are members because they don't know. No one no one tells them when they buy And they're paying they're for it in a roundabout way. I mean, yeah. the businesses, yeah. certainly the property owners aren't paying it. Yes, so, for sure. Uh, so what are they looking to get from that? Yes, so we have a lar large following on social, uh, social media, probably close to 6,000 that follow us. So it's very easy to promote our businesses. Like a few weeks ago, somebody set up a pop-up park and it just went viral overnight. It was thousands, tens of thousands. What was that? A pop-up market in the middle of the parking lot next to McDonald's. And then McDonald's uh, this summer had their 50th anniversary across Canada, and this is one of the first McDonald's, the first in Nova Scotia. Right. Yeah. So we posted one night, the next morning there was 30,000 views on that. So it's, it really works. People are seem, a lot of people seem to be following us. And our businesses get that. They get that promotion like any other business district will do. And right. they're all about safe and clean. So we have somebody cleaning the streets. We have a relationship with the police department. We have webcams right outside this building, an east and a west. One faces east, one faces west. So you can see for safety reasons and also for the traffic or snow plowing. Or if there's an accident or something happens, we can share the tape with the police department. So that's our clean and safe that most you know business districts will do. But we're also in transformation, so we want to talk to people about what how they want this community to transform. When we rebranded, we rebranded to the speech bubble because we want to talk to people about that. We don't want to be the ones to decide what's going to go here and then cross our fingers and hope people like it. So we want to attract people that will want to live here. We're studying demographics, social demographics, which is why the Age Friendly Plan came up, because we see that there's a housing shortage. Dartmouth East has 2% um, uh, vacancy rate for rentals. And you find the population is changing. The, Are more younger definitely. people moving, young families moving back? The other thing, that's true, but in this area, what we're, we want to promote and share with people that before the transformation that we're undergoing, we already have, in walking distance, an elementary school, a junior high school, a right. high school, You're and there. a college. And a college, yeah. So it's a prime area to not only, live, area. not only live, but to set up business. Plus, we're right in the center of Dartmouth, surrounded by 90,000 residents. We don't have the boutiques and things that downtown Dartmouth have, and we're fine to send people to downtown Dartmouth for that. But what we do have is a lot of health and wellness organizations, yeah. and we will have an age-friendly community. We have an age-friendly community plan, and it will be implemented. So it will be a place where there's a lot of wellness, medical, health services, and people of all ages feeling welcome and connected. Well, this has been great, Graziella. I want to thank you very much, as I said earlier, for taking the time to be here to tell us all about the Village Thank you.